thank you all for coming today. I thought I'd share with you my story of how I got here. <laughs> anyway, so I'm just going to start. <clears throat> when I considered that I started taking art lessons at the age of 15, I now realize that this is when I began my training as an artist. I started taking lessons one night a week at the MSH Studio School of Art, where I drew and painted from live models. At the same time, my parents had a weekly subscription to Time Magazine, and every week I eagerly looked forward to checking out the weekly art review and photos of the current art showing in New York. Remember, this was the 60s. It was here that I saw the abstract expressionist artists who, unbeknownst to me, were to become the artists I refer to as my artistic parents. I would cut out the pages and place them in a file folder, and I longed for understanding on how to look at these paintings. I had no idea what they were about, but someone was writing about them. They greatly puzzled me, and I was very attracted to them. In 1970, I was accepted into Fine Arts at York. It was a new program in its second year. The answer to my questions on how to look at these paintings amazingly came in my first year. I took a course called Modernist Painting, where the major emphasis was to analyze the visual components of the painting, composition and space of artists from Manet to the present day. My questions as to what is being perceived were being answered, and I was elated. I couldn't believe that I was getting these answers that I had wanted for so long. By the time we came to the abstract expressionists in the second term, my eye was developed enough to finally understand and experience this great movement. In my third and fourth years at York, I gradually started to paint abstractly. And in my fourth year, through a series of events, I was taken on by the Pollock Gallery. Um, still, as I was an undergraduate and had my first show at the Pollock Gallery. Uh, actually, I didn't know it was going to be a solo exhibit. Uh, Jack had called me. He had seen my work at um, a fundraising show at the Best Setic Synagogue. And uh, he was drawn to the work. And I came home from, from York. I was in my fourth year. And my mother said to me, oh, somebody named Jack Pollock called. You should call him back. <laughs> and I went, what? <laughs> so I called him back. And he said, um, I, I, I want to show your work. And I want to come see your work tomorrow. And we made a, a date at, to meet at 9 a.m. on a Friday at York University. And the whole night, I'm telling you, I rolled up the rug in my bedroom and I painted all night. Works on paper. It's a true story. And we met the next Friday, uh, the next day, I should say. He picked up a all this work, he, this one, that one, that one. He told me where to take it to be framed. And then on the Sunday, he said to me, um, I want you to come to the gallery to sign the contract. And I still had no clue. I thought this was some group show or something. So my brother, Ernie, who was a lawyer at the time, I think he was articling by that time, I said, you know what, uh, you got to come with me. You know, I need a lawyer with me. So we drive up to the gallery. It was on a Sunday, and we pull up. It's on Dundas across from the AGO. And there's a sign in the window. And it says, opening next week, Judy Singer. And I, I, I remember grabbing his arm and going, I'm having my own show. Oh, my God. I, like, it was astounding. And sure enough, the next week, it, it, it was open. And that was it. And everything sold. I mean, those days are done. But <laughs> it was sold out by the end of the day. Anyways, I showed with Jack for six years. And he... After he closed his gallery, he moved to France. And then I was taken on by Gallery One, which is where I met Sharon Fishstein. 
It was there that one of my paintings was purchased for the Heinz collection in Pittsburgh, and I was invited to represent Canada at the Carnegie International in Pittsburgh in 1982. The next year in 1983, I attended the Triangle Workshop in upstate New York, and that was a very special and pivotal thing that I participated in. The Triangle Workshop was started by Sir Anthony Caro, whose incredible sculpture is right at the back of the, uh, the gallery there. And he had this idea of bringing artists from all over the world together, uh, working uh, in a two-week workshop. And I got accepted to it. And I went to this workshop. And for two weeks, we parked ourselves in these uh, old dairy barns where every artist, there were 30 artists from all over the world. We, we all had our place to work. And it, we were just totally immersed in art. And at the, you know, on the weekend, Clement Greenberg came to the famous critic to do crits. And a lot of famous artists came through uh, that workshop. Um, I got friendly with Larry Poons, who, I don't know if you know who Larry Poons is, he's a very famous uh, artist from New York. And he was the head of the painting part of this workshop. And we kind of got friendly a little bit. And then one day, you know, I took a break from my painting. I, you know, it's like so much every day work, blah, blah, blah. I needed a break and I start walking around and there's this room that we had these huge barns and there's this room and I peek in and Larry is there and he goes like this, I should come in. He didn't say anything, he just come in. He pointed to a pail on the floor and I sat down. And what I experienced in there was life changing actually for me. <clears throat> he had a room maybe around this size and the whole room was covered in one piece of canvas. So he had enrolled one piece on all four walls. They were stapled to the walls. He had these big five gallon um, uh, pails that he had taken his paint out of. And he was mixing it. He had hand blenders and all industrial blenders. And he was mixing all this paint. And I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but at the time he was doing these uh, paintings where the paint would uh, kind of trickle down the canvas and then he would crop them afterwards. So I sat there and he took, he, and he's a small man. He took this heavy pail on his shoulder and he whipped himself around and the paint hit the, the, uh, the canvas. and it like cascades, like a waterfall of paint. And he filled the whole room. And he was, it was July. So, you know, he was sweating. And, and the paint was all over the place. But what he had done, he had created these waterfalls of uh, paint everywhere. So when it dried, and uh, a few, uh, I don't know, must have been three or four days later, then Clement Greenberg, the critic, came in with Walter Darby Bannard, another critic, and Karen Wilkin was there. She's another well-known critic. And they started cropping the paintings. It was called Find the Painting, right? So, and this is how he worked. And he got quite a few paintings out of this. I mean, uh, uh, the other stuff gets discarded. I mean, threw it out. But after that experience, I, I walked out of there. I felt so blessed to have experience somebody's technique that was so different than I had ever experienced and it was so audacious uh, and I, I walked out of that uh, room and I said I can never paint again the way I was painting and I never did after that I just I, I worked on the floor and I put lots of paint on the ground on my canvas and I was on all hands uh, and knees and arms, and then I would crop the painting just like he did, and it it, cha it changed things for me. I don't work that quite that way now. I can talk a little bit about that later. But it was a, an incredible thing to have experienced. It was life changing. Um, anyways, I've had lots of shows. I taught at York for many years, and I lecture now on how to look at paintings. 
Um, but now I'd like to, to share with you a bit of how I do work now. This is how my process. Um, I worked now on stretched canvases. I used to staple my, my uh, canvas to the floor. Uh, but now I prefer to have um, the edge defined for me. It gives me kind of a boundary that I like to work from. And I first wet my canvas. So it's very wet when I work. And um, I don't know if you, when you get a new shirt, it has sizing on it. And then when you wash the shirt, the sizing is off and the shirt is softer, right? So all new fabric has sizing on it. So I put something in the water. It's like, they call it wetting agent. And it, it breaks down the sizing on the canvas so that it, it's easier to receive the paint. And um, the, so I work very quickly because as soon as I put, make it wet and I start putting my marks on and I use my hands and I use big, huge brushes, uh, the, but the painting dries as, as soon as I put the, the water on. So I have to work very quickly. So it's a very focused way of working. I, I, sometimes I don't even realize that I've spent three hours <laughs> working on this thing because I'm working so quickly and adjusting it and putting on the floor and putting it up and, and quickly adjusting it. And then I have to watch uh, because my studio is at home, you know, every few hours I'm walking in there and I'm watching it dry. And I say to Henry, oh my God, it's it's not drying the way I want. And it's just, it's a constant checking back and forth on it. And sometimes I add to it while it's still damp. But mostly once it's there, that, that's what you're going to get. So, um, it, so the next day I come into my studio and it's completely dry. And then I put it up. And it's a whole different ball game because it's vertical now. I have to work on it kind of um, on the floor or on a, on a slant. And physically, it's very challenging because, you know, I'm not uh, 30 anymore. So, and sometimes I get so engrossed in it that, you know, the next day I wake up and I'm so achy because I didn't realize what I was doing. It's like I'm in this trance state. It's very... It's wonderful, actually, to get so lost in it. Um, anyways, I spent hours looking at the new work because it's new to me. Like, I don't know half the time whether it's a good painting or not a good painting. And, you know, I always get my two cents from Henry when he comes in the next day. He has learned to look at work. And then I have artist friends who come in to help me because it's, it's very difficult. As a matter of fact, this painting that's hanging here, I did at the end of August, and it's it was so new to me that it sat there on my wall. I looked at it every day for two months. Uh, an artist friend of mine, uh, Janet Hendershot, came to my studio, and she said, oh, that's really a good painting. It's different than anything you've done. And I said, really? Because I, I wasn't really sure. It felt so new to me. And then I decided I was going to put it on Instagram and Facebook. And the feedback I got, the, the response was just so amazing. And Sharon called me and she said, I want you to bring that painting to the show. And so we traded it out with a new one, uh, this one. So again, sometimes, most of the times it, it's a puzzle to me. And because I'm so familiar with it, it's really hard to be um, impartial. Um, the paint itself, if you look at a tube of paint, it's just a tube of paint. I mean, it's, it's nothing really. It's, it's some kind of acrylic emulsion with uh, color in it. Um, but when, when an artist uses it, it, it transforms. I call it a living collaboration. Um, somehow the paint absorbs and transfers and bodies and of the energy and feelings of the artist. And this is what we talk about uh, when we talk about the artist's touch and how they put paint on. The greatest artists somehow have what I call a supercharged battery that um, is able to transmit this high energy from the artist 
onto the canvas. Not all artists have this kind of energy. That's why, uh, like I always say about Matisse, who I think his touch and his color and the way he puts things, paint on the canvas, it, I always say even on a bad day, even a, a Matisse painting that's not as good as his best, it's still good because he still, ha he, he somehow has this gift of being able to transform whatever energy that he's channeling or embodies through the paint, through his hand, through the paint and onto the canvas. So, um, you know, th this paint becomes uh, very, very uh, important to the artist and the energy and the feelings go into the paint and onto this flat surface that isn't flat anymore and is full of space and feeling. Um, so uh, Matisse is one of those artists whose touch and color sense to me is the most superb and I'm highly uh, uh, indebted to him and, and uh, inspired by him. Personally, I strive for what I call aesthetic mastery. And standing in front of a great work of art is uplifting and reminds me of the dignity that humans are capable of. Iris Murdoch says, great art inspires love in the highest part of the soul. And well, I share that philosophy that great art is about love. And I hope that I am successful enough that these paintings have that feeling of love uh, that you will experience, that I can share with, with the world. So um, I just wanted to say that I'm honored to be showing here at this gallery because Sharon is committed to exhibiting um, art that we both love, art that evolved from the abstract expressionism, expressionist movement. Uh, I guess that's it. And I just want to thank everybody for coming out and supporting me. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you.